as God's chosen people, say with me, chosen. chosen, chosen, understand, as God's chosen people, we are called to live out our identity through holy conduct, the way that we live our lives, submission to authority, and enduring suffering with the character of Christ, thereby reflecting his light to the world. The way that we live matters. And the way that we live is determined by our identity. It's determined by who we are according to the word of God. So let's dive in, shall we? Verse 1 says this, Therefore, rid yourselves of all malice, all deceit, hypocrisy, envy, and slander of every kind. Like newborn babies crave pure spiritual milk, so that by it you may grow up in your salvation, now that you have tasted that the Lord is good. He starts off this verse with therefore. So you go through chapter one and he's basically telling them to be holy and to be alert and to be sober minded. And he's setting up this idea that Jesus was chosen and sacrificed for you. And then he starts, therefore, since you are chosen, since you are God's people, what do we need to do? We need to rid ourselves of a couple of things. Malice, deceit, hypocrisy, envy, and slander of every kind. That's being a hater, that's gossiping, that's lying, that's pretending to be something that you're not, that's doctoring up your Instagram profile to make it more appealing to the opposite sex when that's not even who you actually are. Catfishing people. I want to implore you to think about how we change these things. How do we rid ourselves of malice, deceit, hypocrisy, envy, and slander? We do the opposite. The opposite of malice is what? It's kindness. We start to act kindly. The opposite of deceit is honesty. We start dealing honesty. Too many times we lie and we doctor the truth in order to save people feelings, but when you're lying and you're being dishonest, you're only creating issues for down the road. You're essentially delaying the inevitable. And I'm talking about having integrity in every aspect of your life, whether it's lying about how much money you make so that you can afford the new car that you're trying to get, right? It, whether it's lying or, or, or fudging the numbers a little bit on your tax return. Hello, people. Am I talking to anybody out there? Some of you are like, no, because the IRS is watching. So don't put your hand down. Put your hand down. There's an auditor in the back, like <laughs> numbers on IRS. And you're like me. And he's like, all right, we'll talk after. The opposite of hypocrisy is sincerity. One of the biggest issues with Christianity is hypocrisy, is because too many Christians say one thing and then live the other way. Not enough Christians live out what it is that they're preaching. And so we look like hypocrites. Oh, you're telling us to love and you're telling us to do this and this and this, but your life doesn't even reflect that. And so therefore, as believers, we need to rid ourselves of malice, hypocrisy, deceit, envy. Too many people are envying other people. In the day and age of social media, we see where that person just took a trip. Oh, I don't know how they got that trip. I know their finances. They shouldn't be balling out like that. They must have spent their tax return. I, mean, I know they ain't got no money. They must have got that PPP loan. Right? They must have went and checked into cash because right? I know that they ain't balling like that. Oh, he owes me $40, but he's got a new pair of Jordans. You're envying. The opposite of envy is contentment. And then the opposite of slander and gossip, which I think runs rampant in the church, is what? It's praise. Stop tearing each other down and let's start lifting each other up. Therefore, as followers and believers of Christ, as chosen ones, let's do a better job of praising, encouraging, uh, edifying, and lifting other up instead of tearing each other down. In verse 2, he says, like newborn babies crave spiritual milk so that by it you may grow up in your salvation. This is a picture of spiritual maturity, Right? Is who here knows a Christian who's been a Christian for a long time but doesn't look like it? It's the epitome of, it's almost like when you see the OG on the corner and he's like 60 years old and he's still got his 40 and his pants are sagging. That's like, bro, like you're old. You should probably stop gangbanging. Like, who are you gangbanging on? Father time? Like, stop. Like, what are you doing, bro? You, you're balding, you have gray hair, and you still, got the, you still got the move. And it's just like, at, at some point, you've got to grow up. And in the same way, there's Christians like that who are old, who've been Christians for 10, 20, 30 years, but there's no fruit in their life. There's no, there's no fruit. They're not, they're, they don't look like Christians should look. And so it doesn't matter how long you've been saved. You can be a person old in Christ, but still very spiritually immature. And in the same way, you can be 
young in Christ and be spiritually mature. Listen, our maturity is a direct reflection of how much time you spend in the presence of God. Let me say that again. Your spiritual maturity is a direct reflection on how much time you spend in the presence of God. What does your devotion look like? What is your prayer life? look like show me your friends who are you spending the majority of your time with he says here too like newborn babies crave pure spiritual milk you crave what you consistently consume who here has a sweet tooth who here who here wrestles with a little bit of sugar right some of you guys you know what I mean my wife has to have something sweet after every time we have dinner or lunch or breakfast she always has to have something sweet Right? And I'm not, I don't have it like that. I, I, like, I like ice cream. I like sweets. But I don't have a sweet tooth because I don't consume sugar on a regular basis. But she has this taste or this craving because it's something that she constantly consumes. And in the same way, brothers and sisters, what you're constantly consuming is what you'll constantly crave. So if you're not constantly craving the word of God, then what is it that you're eating? What is it that you're consuming? Too many of us have a taste and a hunger, a craving for the things of this world. We crave and thirst and hunger after worldly success, after fame, accomplishment, award, and accolade. We crave and long for relationship, thinking that these things are the very things that are going to satisfy us or complete us. We've got to do a better job of growing up, maturing, and craving what God's called us to. In verse three, he says, now that, say that with me, now that, now that. So he says, therefore, rid yourselves, now that you've experienced God. So if you're here today and you're a non-believer, let's just say you're here, you're seeking, you don't know Jesus. We're not talking to you, right? Like, uh, I want you to know Jesus. It's the best decision I've ever made, but this word is for Christians. This is Peter talking to the persecuted church. There's still very much applicable things here for those of you who might not be believers, but he says, therefore, you've been chosen now, right? Now that you have tasted the goodness of God, now that you have tasted the Lord is good. I want you to know this, and we're going to move on from this point. When you stop eating, you stop growing, which results in malnourished Christians. And that's what the body of Christ often looks like, is people who proclaim to be Christians, but they don't consume the things of the Spirit. They're malnourished. You wonder why you have no joy, no peace, no purpose, no comfort, why you're always anxious, why you're always depressed, where you feel like you're being pulled apart, is because you don't have true joy and true peace. It's because you do not have a relationship, an honest, open, real relationship with God. And we need to do a better job of feeding that, a better job of consuming the things of the Spirit through devotion, time spent alone, through prayer, and by surrounding yourself with the body of believers. Amen? Amen. In verse 4, it says, As you come to him, the living stone, right, rejected by humans and this living stone is jesus as you come to him the living stone our god is alive he is not dead by the way jesus rose on the third day jesus is alive very much as he was before jesus is alive he is the living stone rejected by humans but chosen by god and precious to him you also christians you also right this is identity we're preaching identity to you you want to know as a christian how you should live rid yourself now that you have been given your, like now that you've tasted the Lord is good. And as you come to him, Christians, you also, like living stones, are being built into a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, offering spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. So again, he is the living stone. As we come to him, we are being built up into the church. That's what we are. That's what you have been called to do. You haven't been saved to sit on the sideline. You haven't been saved to just show up here and to watch me read the word of God to you. Each and every one of you are on mission in the places that you eat, live, work, and play. Each one of you are on mission and are called to be lights in this world. And we're going to get to chapter 2, verse 9. We're going to get to verse 9 in just a second. You have been saved for a purpose, each and every one of you, not just to sit here and watch me preach. You have been called to be built up into a spiritual house. So each time a sinner puts his faith in Christ, each and every time, God is picking up another dirty and dusty stone and putting it in its place. Each and every one of you are a part of a bigger body, 
Each and every one of you have a purpose. Each and every one of you have been chosen. Each and every one of you are precious to God. Each and every one of you are royal, a holy nation. Each and every one of you have come to God for a reason. He's called you. I love this idea in verse 5. It says, you also, like living stones, are being built into a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood. Let's, let's unpack that for just a second. A holy priesthood. In the Old Testament, only those who were born as Levites could be priests. So there was this picture in the tabernacle at the, at, back in the Old Testament. There was the Holy of Holies, a place that only the high priest could go once a year on the Day of Atonement to offer a sacrifice for the sins of all the people. And so you have this area that's cut off by this big veil, all right? And only the high priest could go behind that veil once a year. But here the scripture says when Jesus died, the veil was torn. And now we are also this holy priesthood. We're this royal priesthood. And now have the ability to go into the holy of holies, to the throne of God and have access to him. That's good news, right? That's good news. Too many of us as Christians, we don't think that God hears us or that he doesn't care about us or he doesn't want to hear our prayers or we don't have access to him or he's turned our back to him. But the Bible says that you are a holy priesthood. You're being built into a holy priesthood. And this is good news. You have access to God's presence. This is your identity as a Christian. Write this down. God wants to hear from you. God chose you. You are precious. You are his holy nation. That's good news. So the veil was torn, and now we have the opportunity to go before his throne. It said in the last part, we offer spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. This isn't talking about us actually like killing a, a bull or a goat or a sheep like in the Old Testament, right? If you guys read the Old Testament, you're just like, it was a bloodbath or a barbecue. It looked, I mean, it, it was always like they got, the, they got the ribs, they got the lamb, they got, they got it on, right? But it was always for the atonement of sins or some kind of a sacrifice as a holy priesthood under the New Testament because after Jesus died, all of this is wiped away. We no longer have to be separated by the Holy of Holies. We have access to God. This is our identity. But ever since the, the new covenant has gone into place, right now we have this ability to go to God and now we offer spiritual sacrifices. And the spiritual sacrifices that we offer up, one of them is our bodies. The way that you live your life is a spiritual sacrifice. He's watching you, everything that you do, behind closed doors, in your bathroom, on your screen, when nobody you think is watching, God's there, watching. Another way that, he, that we can offer up spiritual sacrifices is praise from our lips. When we worship together, that's a spiritual sacrifice. We're taking a moment to lift up praise. You might hear somebody in the front row yell, Jesus! Or you might hear my brother in the back yell, Hallelujah! Right, you hear people offering up these spiritual praises because they've been touched by God. They've been wrecked by God. And so they're here giving it all. They don't care about what other people think because they know their identity. They know that they're ridding themselves of these things that were a part of their past life. They understand that they're being built up. They recognize that they're a holy priesthood and that all that we can do is offer up these spiritual sacrifices in the spirit. Another way that we can do so is by good works for others grabbing somebody a water, walking a little old lady across the street, checking in on somebody, sending a text message to make sure that somebody's okay, giving your resources, and preaching the gospel and saving souls. There's many ways that you can offer up spiritual sacrifices. But that's the beauty of our identity, is how we live is an offering. How we live gives glory and praise to God. Verse 6 says this. I'm going to explain that it. It's not going to be on the screen. I'm going to read 6 through 8. It says, for in scripture it says, see, I lay a stone in Zion, a chosen and precious cornerstone. This is Jesus. Say cornerstone. Cornerstone. He lays a chosen and precious cornerstone, and the one who trusts in him will never be put to shame. That's a beautiful, beautiful promise. When you put your trust in Jesus, the cornerstone, chosen and precious, you will never be put to shame. Because your sins have been forgiven. Your sins have been atoned for. The full price, the sins before, the sins of today, and the sins of tomorrow have been paid for in full. You will never be put to shame. You will never be put to shame. Now to you who believe, 
this stone is precious, but to those who do not believe, the stone the builders rejected has become the cornerstone and a stone that causes people to stumble and a rock that makes them fall. They stumble because they disobey the message, which is also what they were destined for. To you who believe, when you put your faith in Jesus, you no longer have to be worried about being put to shame. I lived in shame for a long time. Uh, some of the things that were shameful for me is I was ashamed of the fact that I lived in foster care, even though it wasn't my fault. All right, when I was in foster care, I was ashamed of that because I would go to school and there's kids with both parents. And, and, and they would pull up, they'd have the Air Maxes, the foam posits, they'd have all the dope shoes, and I was rocking Pele's. You know what I mean? I had some Eagle Creeks. Uh, I had some, some, some Velcro shoes. And I was ashamed of being in foster care because where we got gifts, we went to the, the, the giving tree, or we went to the food bank, or we got our food on EBT. And the, the way that I grew up, I, I, had, I had to get my clothes off of uh, layaway at Walmart. Anybody remember layaway? I got any layaway kids? See, shame, nobody raised their hands. We got one person, all right? There was shame attached to it. And so I was ashamed of foster care. When I got out of prison, I was ashamed that I went to prison. I was appalled that after all of my effort and trying my hardest, I still ended up there. So I was ashamed of that. I was ashamed that I went through a divorce. I was ashamed after 14 years of marriage. I failed a marriage. I failed a relationship. There was shame that was attached to that. But listen to me. Regardless of the shame that you might have experienced in this world, to those who believe and put their faith in Jesus, this cornerstone, it says that you will never be put to shame. You will never be put to shame. He takes that shame. He takes the ashes and gives you beauty. He gives you back what you've lost in ways that you can't even think of or fathom. A cornerstone is the first stone that's set in a construction of a building, and it determines the position of all the other stones. Jesus is just that. He was before, and he is forever, the alpha and the omega. He is the cornerstone that all of this, this thing that we call life, has been designed around. And you were chosen, and you are precious, and you have been called. First Peter chapter 2, verse 9, this is the verse that we have established Royal City Church on. It says this, and this is identity. Trust me, this is, what, this is what I'm talking about. But you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood. We talked about priesthood already, but a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession, that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. Verse 10 says, once you were not a people, but now you are the people of God. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. You are chosen. You are a royal priesthood. You are holy. You are a holy nation. You are a special possession. And now, because we've established what your identity is, you have been given a mission. And that mission is to declare. Do you guys understand what declare means? Declare means to make something known or announce something officially, often in a public or formal way. God rescued me from my shame. He rescued me from my sin. He rescued me from my depravity and the life that I chose for myself by the blood of Jesus. And now what I do is I get on every platform and every place and every space that God opens a door for and I declare the goodness of his name. And many of you aren't feeling purposeful because so many of us ask, well, what's, God, what's God's purpose for my life? First off, do you know who you are? Do you know that you're chosen? Do you know that you're special to God? Do you know that you're precious? Do you know that you are a royal priesthood? You have access. You are sons and daughters of God most high. You are kings and queens of God. He has saved you for a reason. You have been set apart not to blend in with this world, but to make a stand. Just like it says, you are a living stone that's being built up in his image and likeness. I'm preaching the word of God better than you guys are responding right now. Holy set apart a nation do you guys understand what a nation is in the time of the bible a nation wasn't just places separated by borders nations were large groups of people that would come together so this right here this is a large group of people who share a common identity and that identity is children of god so this in this room is a representation of what heaven's going to look like 
I've got blacks and whites and Latinos and Asians. I've got people from every persuasion in this room. This is what heaven's going to look like. This is a holy nation. And when we step up and the men and women of this body of church start to believe who they are, they start to realize that they've been chosen, when they start operating as royal priests and priestesses, when they understand that they are holy and called to be set apart, then we can experience revival in this city and in the cities that you come from. And that's what we're here for. To what? To declare the goodness. To announce something. It says here, to what? To declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. I don't know about you. I can only speak as a witness for myself. But God has pulled me out of darkness. And because of that, not because of fear, not because of anything else, I want to tell every single person I come into contact with. You're searching for purpose. It's found right there. It's not as sexy as you might think. It's not as, it's not as you know, this, this beautiful picture because most people want purpose. And they're like, oh, well, my purpose is I'm going to be in, you know, I'm going to have a Fortune 500 company. And my purpose is I need a boat and a toy hauler. And my purpose is that I need to live on Rodeo Drive. And this is my purpose. And my purpose is attached with doing. But listen, your purpose isn't attached with doing. Your purpose is attached to being. And you are called to be followers of God. You are called to be a chosen people. Are you living like that? You're called to be holy and set apart. Are you living like that? You are called to declare the goodness of him who called you out of dark into his marvelous light. Are you doing that? When you start doing this, what we've been called to do, then you will, you will start to experience purpose and fulfillment and the peace that you're searching for because it's found in Jesus. I'm going to take that silence as conviction. I love in verse 10, he says, once you were, but now you are. He says it twice. Once you were not a people, but now you are the people of God. Christians, you are the people of God. This is your identity, right? Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. Some of you need to step over from who you once were to who you now are. You need to let go of who you were and start operating out of who you are. And many of you don't know who you are because you refuse to open this and dive in and allow the word of God to speak to you. And he says, dear friends, I urge you as foreigners and exiles to abstain from sinful desires which wage war against your soul. This is identity. He's telling identity. He's identifying who you are. Christians, this is how you should live. Live such good lives among the pagans or the Gentiles or the people. Not, when you think of pagans, it's not people who are, they've got horns on their, uh, on, on their little helmet and they're walking around. like They're in foreign lands and those are pagans those aren't people who believe the same thing that they do so when you're in this land listen as we're a holy nation god's people when you walk outside that door you're surrounded by pagans you're surrounded by people who don't believe the same thing that you do who are not holy who are not set apart who have not been chosen who are not royal priesthoods does that make sense so in the same way right when he says i urge you as foreigners and exiles to abstain from sinful desires which wage war against your soul Live such good lives, the way, that you live, the way that you live matters, among the pagans, that though they accuse you of doing wrong, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day he visits us. Live a life that is so filled with the light of Jesus that people will stop and say, what is it that you've got? What, what hope are you holding on to? Because I see the chaos in the, the, the community. I see the headlines of war and famine and disease and pestilence. And for some reason, there's a light about you. For some reason, there's something different about you. It's sitting here saying, live such a good life in the midst of this world that it gives praise and glory to God. This really speaks of how to live this new identity. They were scattered under scrutiny, under watchful eyes. How you live your life as a witness. This is obedience out of devotion and not out of duty. Too many people think that God is here just dropping a hammer and you've got to do X, Y, or Z. Listen, I live for God because of what he's done for me. Because of what he's done for me. It's the absolute very least that I could do is to be obedient to what he's calling us to do. And one little note on living in this world, but not of this world. I, I read this quote and it said, separation isn't isolation. It's contact without contamination. Let me say that again, right? Separation isn't isolation. So we can be set apart, a holy people, and still be out in the world. It doesn't mean that we create Christian country clubs and we create these echo chambers and just surround ourselves with other Christians. Because the unfortunate fact is that we have to be out there. 
How, how does a light shine in a room full of light? We have to go into the darkness to shine our lights. And so separation, being set apart, being a holy nation, doesn't mean we isolate and we only go to Christian things. What it means is that we go into contact with the darkness, but we don't allow the darkness to contaminate us. Verse 13, I'm going to just read this. This isn't going to be on the screen. Uh, it says, submit yourselves for the Lord's sake to every human authority. This is going to get dicey because I, I know some of you guys have problems with authority. Right? Hey, some of you, you know what I'm talking about. He says, submit whether to the emperor as the supreme authority or to governors who are sent by him to punish those who do wrong and command those who do right. For it is God's will that by doing good, you should silence the ignorant talk of foolish people. Live as free people, but do not use your freedom as a cover-up for evil. Live as God's slaves. There's a trigger word. Show proper respect to everyone. Love the family of believers. Fear God. Honor the emperor. When you read this scripture, you're like, especially because like we're, in the, we're on the cusp of uh, an election, right? Coming up in November. This is a very politically turbulent time to live in. You have... Democrats versus Republicans, you have one school of thought on this side and another school of thought on the other. And here, Peter is telling the Christian believers to submit for the Lord's sake, for the Lord's sake, he says, to every human authority. And you're like, to every human authority? Like, even if he's not consciously there? Like, what authority are we supposed to submit ourselves to? And he says, yeah, whether to the emperor as the supreme authority or to the governors who are sent by him to punish those who do wrong. Understanding the context is basically saying this. As Christians, okay, we need to integrate into our community and we need to follow the laws without compromising. That's what it's calling us to do. That's what he's telling these scattered Christians to do. You're in these different places under different authority. What you need to do is you need to integrate into your society and into your community, and you need to follow the rules and the laws without compromising. And you might think to yourself, to every, like I keep saying it, to every human authority? And is there a time that we should resist? Is there a time that we should fight back? Is there a time that we should say no or make a stand? Absolutely. Christians are called to submit to authority unless that authority requires actions that go against God's commands. Because we serve God first and man later. So we, it, to, to clarify, when we talk about this, we submit to the final authority before we submit to man's authority. But if it does not contradict that, then we stay in alignment. Some, a couple of examples real quick. Abolition of slavery. That was a law, right? Probably should fight that. Thank God that they did. I wouldn't be here. The civil rights movement, another act of civil disobedience that was done in a way that was orderly, um, standing against corrupt regimes. Um, in such cases, resistance is appropriate. There is a time and a place to resist authority, especially when it flies in the face of what God's called and commanded us to do. But it should always, mark this, it should always be carried out in a spirit of humility, peace, and love. Always. A couple of notable People who have done that, Martin Luther King Jr., Desmond Tutu, uh, Cesar, Cesar Chavez, Dorothy Day, Dietrich Bonhoeffer, uh, different Christians or Catholics in spaces who stood up to laws and authorities when they stood in the face and in the way of what God was calling them to do. At the end of the day, it tells us to honor the authorities, um, but honor doesn't mean that we have to agree with them, right? You can operate out of a sense of honor. Uh, we, we don't have to agree with them, but because of their position, we still see them as an image bearer of God. You might not agree with the people who are running for office, if, whether in your local city or your local community or over our nation. You might not agree with them, but they are still made in the image of God. And we are still called to honor them as human beings. And I know that this isn't popular because you want to hate everything about that person because how could they do this and how could they do that? And this isn't right. right you're not following what God's calling us to do. An image bearer of God. How do you hate somebody that you don't even know? So we honor them in a couple of ways. Number one, we can pray for them, right? It's calling us to follow them in the context. This is applicable. We need to be praying for our leadership and the authority and whoever's elected to government. We need to keep gossip and slander out of our mouths. Why don't you try praying for them as much as you talk poorly about them? And we might see a change in the office. The third thing is trust that God is still in control. 
You think he's up there looking like, I can't believe they elected this guy. What am I going to do? Oh, well, Jesus, we're not going back now. Like, he, it doesn't stall God's plans. It doesn't stop what God's doing. At some point, why do we think that because this happens that now all of a sudden it's all going to hell in a handbasket? He's aware of who is going to be in office. He already knows. In fact, he appointed it. He is in control. And then lastly is respect the office even if you can't respect the officer. You got to respect the office even if you don't respect the officer. Chapter 18 or verse 18. I wanted to, I'm, I'm, I'm getting through this whole chapter, you guys, so I know that there's a lot. You're going to have to watch this on YouTube because we're covering a lot of things. Uh, verse 18 says this, slaves, <laughs> that's going to get some of you hung up right there. In reverent fear of God, submit yourselves to your masters, not only to those who are good and considerate, but also to those who are harsh. Let me just stop right there. This scripture particularly was used for years, decades to oppress an entire people group. The Bible was handed and given to slaves. You sometimes hear African-Americans say that Christianity is the white man's religion because it was used to enslave, it was used to oppress, it was used, it was cut, and it was taken out of context. And verses such as this would keep people in states and places of oppression. And so it can sometimes be challenging to preach. Verse 18 of 2 Peter, slaves in reverent fear of God, submit yourself to your masters. Imagine how that would have played out 200 years ago. But also to those who are harsh, for it is commendable if someone bears up under the pain of unjust suffering because they are conscious of God. But how is it to your credit if you receive a beating for doing wrong and endure it? But if you suffer for doing good and you endure it, this is commendable before God. To this you were called because Christ suffered for you, leaving you an example that you should follow in his steps. He committed no sin and no deceit was found in his mouth. This scripture in particular was used to keep slaves docile, to keep slave, slaves weak, and, to, and it would try to prevent them from an uprising or a revolt. But the context of the scripture, let me teach you today, because the slaves that you're reading about here, the true context of the scripture isn't exactly what you might think. Slaves or servants in this time was a term that in the original Greek, the word oiketai referring, was, was referring to a household servant or a slave. The slaves during this time wasn't a widespread institution uh, like, like we know it in our American history. It, it was taken place by the Roman Empire and many early Christians were either slaves or former slaves. So he's talking to Christians who are enslaved in many cases to the Roman government. Does that make sense? So this isn't the, the kind of slavery that we're conditioned to know, right? This is, a, this is a hard sermon. We're talking about politics. We're talking about slavery. Some of you guys are uncomfortable right now, right? But if you don't talk about it here, where are you going to talk about it? And you're going to continue to misunderstand what this scripture is even talking about. So when somebody comes against, right, apologetics, when somebody says, well, you believe a religion where they, they were okay with slavery. No, they weren't. They weren't okay with slavery, but he was addressing a situation that was taking place. There were Christians who were, un, they were enslaved. Do we not talk to them? Do we not talk about it? So now understand the context in which we're reading this scripture. It was a different type of slavery. It wasn't the race-based slavery of the more recent centuries. Now, it still involved people who were legally considered property and who had limited rights. And so the issue and why he's even talking to them is because they were actually causing trouble inside of, of, of what it was. They got saved, and so they thought that their spiritual freedom would equate to a personal or political freedom. And they were frustrated because they weren't, it, it, they weren't just like, oh, I know Jesus, and now you're out of slavery. So he was letting them know, hey, listen, you, you, you're still enslaved. Let's not, like for the name of Jesus, let's not create a revolt. A, a, in this moment, we gotta trust God. In this moment, we've gotta do what is supposed to be done, and that's through obedience. Let's kill them with kindness. That, that's what he's telling the slaves in these times. He says, how is it your credit if you receive a beating for doing wrong and endure it? They were trying to escape and then getting beaten. And like, we're being persecuted. And he's like, no, you're trying to break free. Like, that's the punishment for when you are breaking free. He was telling them to not start a coup, not start a revolt, and to hang out and let God figure this out. So how is this applicable to today? Why would I preach on this in 2024? Because the slaves in these times were far more likely or, or close 
to an employer and an employee. So who here has a job, right? Single guys, if you like, put your hand up even, like it's okay on this one, just like, I got a job. <laughs> because you know the girls are looking around like, oh, he was cute, but he don't got a job, dang. <laughs> just put it, you know, just say you were stretching in the name of the Lord. Um, so if you've got a job and you've got an employer, I'm glad that you guys are awake, that's good. Then you can look at this as not every time your boss disagrees with you are you being persecuted for your faith. Not every time that you're having a hard time on the work site, does that mean that, oh, well, God's just trying to show me something else. I just need to go to a different place. Maybe he's trying to show you that you're the problem because the same problem keeps popping up at every single job that you have. Maybe you should submit to one place and maybe God's put you in that place so that you can be a light in that workspace. But as soon as it gets uncomfortable, we're persecuted. Oh, my God. He doesn't like me because my faith. They saw me praying at lunchtime, and so now they're doing everything they can to get me out of here. They don't care that you're praying at lunchtime. They want you to show up on time and do your job. It's hard to find good employees these days. Nobody's persecuting you for your faith. So that's how it can be applied to today. We're going to jump down and close with chapter 20, or verse 23. It says, so they take this picture of suffering for what's right, and they look at Jesus, because Jesus is the epitome and the example of suffering for right. He literally was sinless, blameless, unblemished. He did no wrong, and yet suffered at the hands of man. And so they point to Jesus. They say, when they hurled, this is verse 23, when they hurled their insults at him, he did not retaliate. When he suffered, he made no threats. Instead, he entrusted himself to him who judges justly. When you trust God, no response is necessary. Too many of us have that hair trigger. Too many of us are, are still living. We got one foot in the world and one foot in the word. We've got that. We got, we're, many of us are from the south side of heaven. Some of you guys still got that little, you know what I mean? Like, oh, I'm going to put hands on holy hands, but don't you mess with me. Uh, like, I'm going to match their energy. Like, there's this, there's this Christian community where, you know, oh, I'm saved, but I'm not soft. That's a shirt, right? Oh, I'm a Christian, but I cuss a little. Like, they, these are shirts I've seen people wear. I'm saved, but not soft. I come catch these holy hands. Like, listen, Jesus left the example. They hurled insults. They didn't, he did not retaliate. He suffered. He made no threats. The human natural tendency is to fight back. But those are the actions of an unsaved person. That's not what we're called to do, family. As funny and as humorous as it can be, that's still operating out of a spirit of the flesh. And we've got to do a better job. It takes a spirit-filled Christian to submit and let God fight their battles. It says here that he himself bore our sins in his body on the cross so that we might die to sin. Again, circling back, we're talking identity. Who are you? You're holy, you're chosen, you're precious. Well, how are we to live? We are to live lives that are filled with light, that are in, uh, filled with integrity, to that, that to declare the goodness of who God is, a life that is dead to sin. By his wounds you have been healed. For you were, this is that con compare and contrast, you were like sheep going astray, but now. You were, but now. Say, but now. You were like sheep going astray, but now. This is your identity. You have returned to the shepherd and overseer of your souls. By his wounds, you have been healed. Not his example. You're not saved by his example. You're saved by the blood sacrifice that was given on your behalf. And now that that's taken place, we follow his example, which is to be the suffering servant, to sit there under the pressure, the immense pressure of the weight of our sins and not retaliate, trust God. You were but now. I close with this thought. In the Old Testament, we see over and over, we talked about sacrifice. We see over and over that the sheep were slaughtered for the sins of the shepherd. But in the New Testament, the shepherd dies for the sins of the sheep. Shouldn't we be living for that shepherd? You were, but now you are. If you have any doubt about who you are, your identity, you are holy, you are chosen, you are precious, you are a royal priesthood, you are a special possession to God, a nation that's been set aside, and now you have been called to live a specific way. Can we start living what we're preaching? 
Can we start devoting ourselves to not being in this world and of this world, but being set apart? It's not a compliment when somebody says, oh, I didn't even know you were a Christian. That's not a compliment. That means that you've blended in so well that people can't even discern whether or not you follow Jesus. But I want to be a light in every place and space that I step. I want people to say there's something different about you. You're hella weird. What is it? You're always happy and smiley. And you got this light. There's something about you. I'm like, it's Jesus. It's Jesus. Stand with me real quick. Thank you for watching. When you tithe, donate, and contribute, you're partnering with Royal City Church and preaching the gospel around the world. So thank you. Before you go, make sure you turn on the notifications and hit that subscribe button. And do me a favor, share this with at least one person. You never know who might need an uplifting message. If nobody's told you today, let me be the first. I love you and God does too.